Book Discussion with Mary Magdalene and Jesus Through the Mists by Robert James Lees This is Chapter 13 Recorded on the 6th of January 2013 Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia yep. Well, welcome everyone to uh, a continued discussion of the book Through the Mists as channeled by Robert James Lees and it's the story of Frederick Winterley's journey through the spirit world. We've been previously doing this as a book group uh, and we've decided to continue on through the book just myself and Jesus who's kindly agreed to join me uh, for a continued discussion. So in our book group we made it up to the middle of chapter 13 and uh, today we're going to discuss the end of chapter 13. Mm. The chapter was called Two Illustrations and we've discussed the first as a group. So, yeah. Mm. So, to, in summary, can I bring you up to speed with what we've discussed? Sure. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the start of chapter 13 told us the story Fred and Kushner have gone across the mists mm -hmm. to observe some things on Earth mm -hmm. and... Um, the first illustration that Kushner showed Fred was the story of Sarah and Lizzie. Mm. And this was a lady, Lizzie, I believe it was, who, um, yes, who was drawn back through the mists by her sister Sarah's grief mm. and longings. Mm. And so we saw how powerful that, that, um, that grief or that unfelt grief really can mm. be on a spirit coming back through the spirit through the mists and um and also the strength of belief systems yes about death and so forth yeah mm. that blocked that actually blocked the truth mm. that lizzie was right by sarah mm. but then there was a moment where sarah actually became aware of lizzie and felt her there mm. felt her and became so overjoyed mm. but then she went back to her family and, and was blocked by the family's belief systems <laughs> exactly exactly and, so Fred was saying, aren't you frustrated, Krishna? And he's saying, no, no, uh, you know, we understand the limitations, mm. but also we're hopeful. Mm. Something I discussed with the group was about um, grief and how many people, I believe, at the group hadn't actually fully grieved the loss of their loved ones. Mm. And um, that was a little bit sobering for some of the group to think about the fact that they're holding on to grief would be having an effect on mm. their loved one in the spirit world. Well, also the fact that they cannot hear people who were so supposedly dead speaking to them is an indication that they're blocked to death somehow and, uh, and an indication that something needs to be worked through. Yeah, 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 yeah mm. absolutely. Yeah. All right, but if we move on to the second illustration. Sure. That starts on page 153 of this, um, mm. this publication. Mm -hmm. And um, Fred and Kushner now come to the home of somebody new. Hmm. And um, I believe we're in the home of Robert James Lee. Exactly. And hearing, hearing about what that's like. Um, and something that struck me here was that Fred says, um, My thanks had scarcely time for expression before we entered a room almost as tangible as ourselves. Hmm. And he can't understand that, why, when everything else is so hazy and misty everywhere else, now suddenly we're in a place where it's almost as real as if, like, I, I'm on earth again in, in a physical body. Mm. And he says, afterwards I discovered it to be due to the spirituality of the man who used it as a study. Mm. And I thought this... This is very interesting if we consider how our own condition affects the rapport uh, of spirits who wish to speak to us. Because obviously um, Robert's um, desire and his own condition created a situation where um, not only were they able to communicate with him freely, but even the environment felt welcome and tangible to mm. them. Yeah. Mm. Well, the brightness of the environment made it meant that it, the spirits could actually easily see the environment, whereas under normal circumstances they can't even easily see the environment. Yeah, so that's mm. interesting, isn't it? You're saying that it's actually the 
the darkness that makes everything obscure to a spirit. Yeah, and, and the darkness is not physical darkness. It, the darkness is all about moral and spiritual darkness. It's all about the lack of love in the location. So, so the darkness is about is not is not what most people conceive it to be, even when they think about it from a spiritual perspective. Yeah. It's actually about the lack of love that's present in the environment that causes the physical darkness of the environment. Mm. And something that comes up through this chapter that I found really um, interesting to, to dwell upon as a thought is that, and on the next page he says, all was so very natural that I almost forgot I had passed into the world of spirit. Mm. They were two, they were not two any longer, but two aspects of one. Mm. And my deep feeling is that's how it, that's how God created it to be. Exactly. There'd, yeah. there'd be no separation between any person who's died and any person who's living. That they'd even be able to see each other still. They'd just be in different physical form. Yeah, mm. yeah. Which, which something I wanted to discuss with you was about um, why you believe God has designed this into the system, that actually there is a deep separation as we see on the earth at the moment, a, a lack of knowledge and a lack of connection between the two worlds. Yeah. That is obviously, as we see here, related to the soul condition. Mm. Um, Most of it, I believe, is protective in the sense that it's loving. It was a loving arrangement God provided that the darker the soul condition, the less you could see. Because if you could see what was actually present, oftentimes you'd be even more terrified and mm. therefore want to get into an even darker condition. So it's actually in a lot of ways a protection mm -hmm. against uh, being totally petrified in your day-to-day -day life. If, if the average person on earth saw the spirits who are around them all of the time and could easily see them because, uh, through this condition, then unfortunately the average person on earth would be very, very frightened most of the time and would find it very, very difficult to live and survive and have a have a day to day life. So it's like as the as the darkness comes down, so does the curtain, if you like, come down yeah. in terms of what you're able to see. Mm. And I think this is a very, very beautiful arrangement that God created so to to give us some level of relief from negative influences so that we have got the potential to grow. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think it's interesting that you say that because often I've heard people complain and say, you know, I'm struggling with negative spirit influence and I can't see it and I don't know what's going on. And I don't believe many people reflect on the fact that it's actually, um, one, they can grow, that develop that awareness mm -hmm. and, and by developing to. their condition. Yeah. And they don't want to because if they did want to, they would have already have developed it most probably. Yeah, mm. yeah. And then... Two, that it's actually something loving to, to lessen that capacity to see when you're of a lesser condition. Mm. Yeah. yeah, very, very much so. There's a, there are, and there are people who can see who are still in a dark condition, obviously, yeah. but you can see that they have very traumatic lives. A lot of them have, uh, are diagnosed with mental illnesses, yeah. schizophrenia, for example, or manic depression. You get a lot of people who can see these spirits who are in themselves not, not a good condition of love towards themselves oftentimes and, and are attracting these very, very dark spirits around them and they, when they can see them and hear them, their life becomes very, very traumatic. Yeah. And, uh, and, but this is something that's happening more and more recently, isn't it? Like the more, in modern times, the more and more people become open, the more they can see, but, the, but it doesn't mean they're seeing anybody in a good condition. They often see people who are in a dark condition themselves. And this is one reason why you see a lot of movies about, you know, demons and yes. and all of those kind of things. Vampires. Vampires and, and um, so forth. Is because the reality is that these are the kind of spirits that we would generally connect to if we could see, see. the spirits we're actually connecting to. and But we are also connected to them, even though oftentimes we don't see them. And oftentimes we want to remain ignorant of our own condition so that, so that we can be ignorant of what's actually being attracted. And there's so much in that, isn't there? In Just when we have a spark of a desire, we always gain more awareness mm. and we always have that opportunity mm. to, to grow. And mm. with RJ Lee's, 
I'm not sure what condition he was in what, when this channeling took place, but um, he certainly wasn't in the fifth, sixth or seventh sphere, but his desire generated a, mm. a situation where spirits felt welcome and at home. And Well, know. the condition he was in is very clear, actually, in terms yeah. of what sphere, because um, if you think about Fred's words, Afra's words were, um, I felt like I was almost there, you know, and it was very hard for me to mm -hmm. tell the difference. And this is an indication that actually the condition of Robert James Lees was very similar condition to Frederick himself. Yes. And so therefore, you, we could suppose that, that the condition was like top of the first sphere, beginning of the second sphere type of condition, um, because it was hardly any differential between Afra's condition and Robert James Lee's condition, yeah. which created the surroundings. Yeah. And if we clarify, later on in the trilogy, Fred takes on the new name Afra. Mm. Yeah, just mm. for those people who haven't read that far ahead yeah. when you refer to Afra. Yeah. So, so Frederick is, uh, is of a very similar condition to Robert James Lee's, and as a result of that, um, can see everything like Robert James Lee's as if he's talking to a person just like he was on Earth. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's very different to his other interactions that he's had so far up in the book when he's come to Earth. Everything's seen as a very hazy outline. And then when we see future references as well, we see a lot of things that are in a very hazy outline, very difficult to see for him, which is an indication of the lower condition. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, lovely. Mm. Um, so... Moving on, to, I made a few notes here. Um, so then, um, basically, Kushner wants to display what's possible. Mm. This is the illustration, and and so he um, he offers to Fred, "Do you want to give a message?" And Fred says, "Oh, I think uh, <laughs> I don't know." If, what does he say? This disclosure completely drowns my powers. So yeah. he's overwhelmed, really, by the whole experience. Yep. Um, so Kushner goes ahead and gives a poem mm. called The Passage of Death. And I wondered if I read through it, if you might like to make comment on each of the verses. Would mm -hmm. you be happy sure. to do that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, The Passage of Death. O brethren of earth, where the soul has its birth, at the thought of the Jordan who quiver, when I fell asleep, I found the deep was a wave of a cloud, not a river. <laughs> yeah, well, he's firstly referring, isn't he, to the earth being the place of the soul's birth. That doesn't mean that the earth is where the soul is born, but it means that the, at the, in your very first incarnation, once you become cognizant and aware, it happens in, at the time, basically, of your birth, the soul's birth, which is at the time of conception. So from the time of conception, the soul has its birth, basically, here on earth. Yeah. And, um, and from the time of that, that time onward, most of the time, one of the biggest fears we have is the fear of death. Mm. And in fact, everybody generally in the entire world has a deep fear of death. And you can see this through their actions. You know, their actions demonstrate this fear of death. And so every time there's a, uh, you know, thought of the future of, of death, then there's always the quiver. But, but every single night when you fall asleep, there's proof that that particular thing doesn't exist because every single night you enter the sleep state and you're aware that death doesn't exist. Yeah. So this is a way of God trying to educate us right from this beginning that even our fear about death is not something to be afraid of. In fact, it's a cloud uh, and not a stream where we can drown in, basically. And I wondered here, I wondered here if a sleep was a metaphor for death um, because he's talking about a river and this, at the thought of the Jordan, this is a Bible reference, isn't it? Of yeah, the river the, Jordan. Yeah, that's the quite Israelite a... nation was travelling firstly, it left Egypt, uh, it was travelling with, with, um, with Moses and, and, and crossed into the area before they entered the Jordan. They, they stayed there for 40 years, uh, according to the Bible, it's because God punish, can't punish the, them for their lack of faith. And then um, after that period of time, they started conquering the nations around about to enter into the, what they called the Promised Land. But the Promised Land was over the other side of the Jordan. And at the time of, of crossing the Jordan, it was in flood. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, very wide, quite wide river, very fast river when it's in flood. 
And so when the nation got caught, and remember there's around 10 million people potentially, according to the way the Bible describes it, got caught there waiting the cross. And now just at the end of their time, just at their end of their, you know, their promise of the future, right when they were promised mm -hmm. to enter the promised land, now there's this huge barrier and a huge amount of fear as a result. It entered the entire assembly according to what the Bible says. And so they were all so afraid of making this last transition, uh -huh. what they viewed as their last transition in the promise, into the promised land. And I suppose a lot of common Christian thought is that death is your last transition and you're entering, if you've been a good Christian, a promised land, a wonderful place. So, yes, but so this, if you even look at most Christians, most Christians are terribly afraid of death. This is why there's huge amounts of grief associated with death for the majority of people. And a lot of it is because there is no real strong understanding of what happens after you die. So, so you know, that of course you're going to be afraid when you don't know. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So... So there he's saying that at the thought of the Jordan, at the thought of crossing into the promised land, we quiver, we're afraid of passing, basically. And we're afraid that the, that the Jordan, which was in flood, is like this rushing river that's just going to smash us to pieces somehow, when really it's lovely cloud that just sort of, you know, <laughs> death is like mist. a cloud that, yeah. you know, leaves you, relieves you yeah. of a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm. Men say that the tomb lies hidden in gloom whence demons and devils forth sally. I came through the place in running my race, and I tell you there is not a valley. <laughs> they say as a guard at a gate that is barred, an angel is standing in state. I passed o'er the ground, but no obstacle found. So I tell you, there is not a gate. <laughs> exactly. So he, here he's referring to a lot of the belief systems that are on earth, isn't he? Firstly, this whole idea that um, there's, you know, devils and demons in darkness and, uh, you know, that you need to be terribly afraid because all these devils and demons are in darkness. The, the reality is there are demons in the spirit world who are in terrible condition. But the average person doesn't play pass into their condition because the average person hasn't murdered and raped and done a lot of other damaging things. And so the average person doesn't pass into the same condition. And, and is it also true, I feel it's true, that when even the person who has done incredibly harmful things, their passing is not necessarily always into this really, as we saw earlier in the book, mm. often there's a smooth passing and yep. people are given the chance to come to terms with the fact that they've passed and then they have to face where their condition places them in the spirit world. Exactly, and, yeah. the, and the time period between their passing and them coming to terms with where they actually are can be thousands of years, actually. Wow. This is the reason why some people become earthbound because they have yet to come to terms with their actual passing. They've yet, they've yet to accept the condition of their own soul and yet to accept what their own soul has actually created. Mm -hmm. So it could be thousands of years before they even enter the location that they actually, their soul has created for themselves to yeah. exist in. Yeah. 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 And it's also interesting, the other statement about, you know, about having the gate, a gate and a bar and an angel saying, I'm going to let you in or I'm not going to let you in, that kind of thing. Is that the classic, oh, I mean, I've heard it so many times that St. Peter guards the pearly gates. And Is this from the Bible or is that well, just something Well, there's inferences been... from the yeah. Bible. Like, you know, according to the Bible, Jesus, myself, gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. And what that meant was that he had the key to the door that barred the gate. In a lot of people's mind, that's what they assume it means. And what, what I actually meant when I was saying to Peter that I gave him the keys of the kingdom is I gave him the key to get into the kingdom. And the key was divine truth and God's love, receiving divine love, the key of prayer, particularly prayer with humility. That, that was what I was referring to. But the majority of people get a bit more literal than that, unfortunately, and then they start assuming that what I meant was that, you know, I gave him a physical key. So now that Peter's up in the heaven, they believe that he's the person who guards the gate, if you like, into the into heaven. It's kind of funny because, you know, so much of your teaching as recorded in the Bible is all about parable and metaphor and yep. and yet there's this very literal take on some things, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. And then as a result of that literal take, a lot of people then go down the track of saying, okay, Peter must be up there with the key, you know, he's going to either let me in or not let me in. So there's, there's some kind of angel barring the gate into yeah. heaven. And the reality, as soon as you die, you, you're in a heaven of a sorts. It's not the end 
you know, the real heaven. It's the heavens of probation, I suppose you could call them. Right. Um, the, the spheres from one till seven are all probationary spheres before you enter heaven, yeah. but, but there's no gate barring them and there's no angel barring them. The only thing barring them is your own condition mm -hmm. of love or, or lack of love. And Fred says when he first passes through the mist, he says, what, you know, I can't remember exactly what he says, but I think it's like, where's the judgment hall? Have I, you know, did I miss that bit? Yeah. You know, I'm waiting for this, this whole um, gate and test I must pass, yeah. which I guess many people, especially probably about the time this was channeled, would have had very strong ideas about that, wouldn't they? Yeah, uh, this is the, I suppose you could say this is the drawback of having a lot of teachings on earth that are not really accurate and, and people imbibe them, you know, they become a part of themselves, they become a part of their intellectual belief systems, they even become a part of their emotional state many times, their fear, it, some of the teachings encourage fear, mm -hmm. other teachings encourage other feelings and as a result of that, uh, a person when they pass often has so many expectations that are unrealistic just as a result of their own, what, what they've imbibed during their life in terms of belief systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this reference to the valley, is that from, that's from a Bible passage as well, isn't it? Yeah, um, the there's quite a... The, the valley of Hinnom or the valley of Gehenna is the, is the reference that it's referring to. And the valley of Hinnom or Gehenna in the, in the Bible referred to a place where they used to throw dead bodies and burn them. So, and, and they only did this with people who were, you know, not very nice people, of course. So murderers, rapists and other people who broke the law. Um, and if there was a punishment of death, generally what they did is they killed them, usually through some kind of method, either hanging or, or, or some kind of stake. And then they would throw their body into the valley. And the valley of Gehenna um, actually had a heap of sulphur in it. So there were fires burning all the time in the valley. Mm -hmm. It was a, a seismic uh, th thing that occurred in, in the valley. And so they'd throw the bodies in the valley and eventually the bodies would be destroyed through the sulphur and the acid and, and the fire. Mm -hmm. And it was a reference to the fact that when you, you know, died and you were bad, that you would never, you know, you're forever dead it's type sort of thing. It's sort of a hellish this kind is, of a, You don't even idea. deserve a burial, yep. was, the, yeah. was the reference. I see. And he's saying that, you know, there's no such valley in the spirit world, of course, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. great. Okay. No gate where men quail, no dark lowering veil, no river your course to resist. I felt but one chill, then a hush, all was still. And I stood on the slopes through the mist. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the entire book is based upon this particular poem, isn't it, really? Yes, yeah. well, the, the, that's the title of the book, isn't yeah. it? Through the Mist. Mm. So, yeah. So he's just describing his passage, really. Yeah, that's right. There's that, you know, there was no gate to, you know, tremble in front of being judged. Or there's no valley that was going to pull you down and suck you into, you know, hellfire and torment and and that kind of constant torment that most Christians believe in. And, and no river, the course to resist, in other words, nothing to force you down another road that you don't want to take. Mm -hmm. um, and all you just feel is just a little, you know, a little change in yeah. the feeling. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're in the spirit world, um, not connected to your physical body anymore. And you're on, on that, you know, on the slopes. On the slopes. Yeah. yeah. And it's such a, like that last verse gives me such like this peaceful feeling like, ah, oh, and there I was on the mist, through the mist on the mm. slope and it would be lovely if everyone kind of had that, that soul realisation that death is just like that, that you, because so many people resist death so much, don't they? I mean, Huge I've resistance. Seen people in my work career prior to meeting you, you know, working with elderly people and mm. people with severe chronic illness who just fought death to the very end mm. and full of terror about it. Mm. And in a lot of ways, they're obviously prolonging their suffering because... As, yeah, I do, do you understand. Feel that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. But I also feel too, for many of them, that they are prolonging their suffering because they don't want to feel the results of their day-to-day -day life. Like, you know, the reality is by the time a person enters that state, 
they are starting to spend a bit of time in the spirit world. And so they are aware of who is around them. And sometimes who is around them isn't very pleasant. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, they aren't very pleasant people sometimes and they're quite frightened. And so, and ironically, by lengthening the time of death, this preliminary time before the person actually passes, they're lengthening the time that these people can affect them, yeah. um, unfortunately. Yeah. And, uh, but often their terror guides their actions, their terror of death. Mm. And one of the things that uh, Kushner is trying to do here is to alleviate people's terror of death Yeah. Um, because it is a big problem. And it's so true, isn't it? I know with my own progress, the longer I deny looking at the results of my actions, the more damage I actually do. So even if I take that in terms of um, what I, whatever realisation or, or change or growth I want to resist now here while I'm on earth, I, the more I resist it, the more damage I accrue basically, mm. uh, whereas the moment of recognition and decision to deal with it, then I can immediately start turning the tide in the other direction. Mm. Mm. And I suppose it's the same with death. The more we, that's what you're saying, isn't it? The mm. more we hold on. Uh, and avoid facing ourselves. And avoid facing our emotional feelings about and our belief systems about death and also about life. Like mm-hmm. we, This is what often people do at the time of death is they're avoiding a recollection of their own life as well. Yeah. And, um, I certainly saw that a lot, mm-hmm. um, people wanting to just forget. Yes. Lot, yeah. and, and the beauty of the soul is it can't forget anything mm-hmm. without there being a pers- purposeful intent to forget. Yeah. So, and a lot of people do that without understanding that if they allowed the memory, things would flow a lot better. Things would actually work a lot better after their passing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah true. Mm. So after this, um, Fred, you know, is struck by how calmly Robert just writes us all down as if it's nothing really fabulous is happening, like it's all run on the mill. Yeah, it's his normal day-to-day life, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Oh, spirit comes to talk to me, I just write that down. Yeah, that yeah. sounded good. No, yeah. Send that off to somebody. File it away. Yeah, and yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but he has this realisation, which is quite, rem- well, I'd love to discuss with you. He mm. says, I realised in those few minutes that if no other link existed in all the earth, that one was quite sufficient to hold the two estates of life in an indissoluble bond of union and capable of being strengthened until all the errors of the flesh should be corrected and the last rebellious child of earth had answered his father's invitation, come. Mm. Which, as always, he says it in such a beautiful way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but this is a very interesting idea that just one medium in a very clear desire, like with a high desire, I mean a pure desire, mm-hmm. uh, in communication with a celestial spirit can bring all the truth to the earth that mm-hmm. is needed to correct error. Mm-hmm. And um, I think though too he's also referring, isn't he, to the fact that, this, that the person on earth had to see and had to feel that there was no separation between himself and people he can't, he, that other people think he can't see. Mm. And, uh, and it's quite remarkable sometimes how much, uh, how much we get laughed at about talking to spirits, right? Yes. And, and a child does it very, very frequently. Um, and often the adults laugh at the child. Of course, mm-hmm. by the time the child becomes a teenager, a lot of times the child has turned off this ability because every single person in his environment generally has laughed at him or ridiculed him for having such an ability. And we actually call this ability, we give it all sorts of medical names even, uh, psychosis and other types of medical names. Or even just imaginary friends and things like that. Yeah, from a child. A child's allowed to have an imaginary friend, but an adult, it's called psychosis. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, a child's allowed to have an imaginary friend that he talks to all day, but for an adult, that's called schizophrenia or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. there, there, there's all these labels we place upon it as adults and the reason why we do that is because we want to ridicule it and ridicule it so much that by the time a person becomes an adult we want them to have forgotten Mm. we want them to forget all about the fact that there is a potential of joining the the life after death with the life before death as if it's one seamless life Mm. 
and most people, I believe, uh, continue to ridicule the process because of their own fear of what it might bring to them. Mm. But it can only bring you joy. More truth always brings you joy. Mm. Um, so, yeah, this is where it's very interesting, I feel. But that is very interesting. And I know for myself, a lot of my blocks as a medium are because I have worked in our so-called mental health system mm. and uh, I have a lot of fears about being regarded as crazy mm. and um, a lot of there's a lot of uh, I suppose faith required or initially there's there's a a need to trust oneself I suppose but even we, that's strange isn't it like the yeah. child if you think about a child talking to his imaginary friend he doesn't need to have any faith at all in the process. He knows the friend's there. He knows that mm -hmm. he exists or she exists. He knows that he can converse. He hears things back, mm -hmm. uh, which he relates often to his family, and yeah. the family will laugh and ridicule and so forth. And eventually the, the, the burden of the ridicule and humiliation grows in the child to such a point that the child just feels like turning off the ability. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. And, and then many people, when they reconnect to this ability as adults, they have to go through exactly the same process of ridicule, laughter, humiliation, mm -hmm. people constantly trying to test them and prove that they're wrong and all this yeah. kind of stuff. And it all just makes it very, very difficult to actually open this barrier that, that the people on earth have put there. Yeah. Uh, and that does exist because of the, the belief systems of the people on earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But really what uh, Fred is saying here is if there was just one medium with that soul-based knowledge that there is no separation and mm. a trust of that process, that that would be incredibly powerful. And also that um, it would bring people to God more, like it yeah. would bring people to truth more. You know, the beauty of having the opening is that you get a flow of information. And what he's really referring to, I feel, is that the the errors of the flesh, which he refers to, which is, you know, all these belief systems and so forth that block the barrier. Once, once there's somebody who can bring the two estates together, the, there is the flow of information and, and strength that comes from that flow of information mm -hmm. to the people who are in the flesh. So a lot of the errors of the flesh can be corrected. Mm -hmm. and, and eventually they could be corrected so much that every person on the earth is actually in this state where they can see spirit, see anybody who's passed, talk to them, know their condition, understand what's going on completely. This is all possible, but it's not possible while people are so closed intellectually or emotionally to the process. Yeah, and I suppose that uh, if we use a biblical term such as prophecy, that would be prophesizing, wouldn't it? Yeah. If, you, if you are channeling material from a celestial being and... We'll talk about that a bit later in the chapter because Kushner refers again to this block that Christians um, had and ha still have to to hearing messages from spirits. Mm. But um, so if that, a, if a Christian saw this particular thing in operation, he would say, "Yeah, the, you know, most of the Christians would say he's just channeling a." bad evil spirit you know because they don't believe that you can channel a good spirit or or channeling god would you say yeah they'd have to feel that they're, he's either uh prophesying from god or channeling a, a dark spirit there's no there's no thought about what is the most obvious and that is that every single person who's ever passed has the ability to communicate with earth and every single person on earth has the ability to receive the communication yeah. uh, you know that is the most obvious uh, thing and most simplest thing that you could assume given the circumstances but 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 it's interesting how people with certain belief systems have either got to go in one direction and condemn something or go in the other direction and assume it's God when it's not yeah mm. yeah and um, it was something that I wanted to discuss with the g group that we were having actually and was going to come up in this chapter because we have talked uh, at different times about the fact that Kushner's constantly saying to Fred, if only Christians would listen, <laughs> you know, if only we could talk to them. And um, in the very, very start of the book, Robert himself um, makes reference to the gifts of the Spirit, yeah. which is from a Bible verse, yeah. um, that it, the belief on earth is that the gifts of the Spirit have ended. Um, for many, well, there was a, what we would call the orthodox Christians, 
uh, you know, and these are very much generally the people who do not believe in the gifts of the Spirit. So, you know, there are quite a lot of religious uh, organisations that would be classified as Orthodox Christians nowadays, and they basically believe that any gift of the Spirit has ceased at, at, at the time of Jesus' passing, basically, mm -hmm. or shortly thereafter, and uh, or I, many of them explain it as being the time that the apostles died. Yeah. So when the apostles died, they feel the gift of the Spirit ceased, and from then on, we, we've already had all the revelation we need, yeah. uh, according to them. We don't need any more revelation. And that's not a very logical proposition, given the fact that God's infinite and God's truth must be infinite. But uh, that's the assumption that they make. And then as a, because of the truth uh, being limited now and being given to, by the end of the times of the apostles, they then say that we don't need any more truth and anybody who communicates anything more than that is just communicating with the devil. Mm. And then there's this huge fear of the devil, like who, who doesn't actually exist, but but who they believe is this, because there are demons who exist, or people who are demonic who exist in the spirit world because of their condition of love, lack of it. Um, but, you know, these particular people um, are often, you know, thinking thinking that, no, there's these devils that, or the devil will come in with you and speak mm -hmm. with you and so forth, and then you get all these mm. additional problems and issues. Yeah, and well, I actually heard from a lady who's a Christian herself um, who watched that um, section where we talked about that and she said to me, because there is a, a common belief amongst Christians at, the at this time that we are in the end times, that they do in fact believe the gifts of spirit are still available. But on discussion with her, it was apparent that she believes that it's the gifts of the spirit are from... I think I'm getting this right, from the Holy Spirit, which is from God. And so there might be prophets, but they wouldn't ever be speaking to people who've passed over. Mm. Um, so um, there's obviously a common misunderstanding even amongst Christians that the gifts of the Spirit are just hearing from the Holy Spirit and not from spirits. Yes. Yeah. And there's a huge, of course, there's this huge bit of misinformation, I believe, in the Christian faith, where every time you refer to something from the Spirit, it's either the Holy Spirit or, or the devil. Yeah. You know, there's no middle ground, where, which, which actually would make more sense, and that is this, this very sensible and, and logical view. Of course, it's easier for us because we've been there and we yeah. know, but, but um, there's this middle ground, which is any single person who passes has the ability to communicate. And any single person who's still on earth has the ability to receive such communication and share in such communication. So, you know, the most logical explanation is often thrown out the window because of a lot of different belief systems that are out of harmony with mm. the truth. And and what you're saying is there's just there's a lot of fear about mostly it's fear, yeah, fear of the devil. We, yeah, yeah. Like and so. and if if the average Christian knew that they weren't prophesying from God through the Holy Spirit, but rather they were channeling a spirit, yeah. uh, many of them would freak out probably. Yeah. But the reality is most of them who are prophesying are actually speaking with spirits every single moment they do it. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, that would allow them the ability to discern, have more discernment. Of course. Yeah, which would actually be a good thing. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. If we jump ahead a little bit, mm -hmm. um, just to keep on that theme, because there's a few other things to discuss, but on page 157, mm -hmm. um, Kushner t talks about this issue a little bit, so mm -hmm. starting from the top of the page. Um, uh, so he says, but whole, uh, it is taught as an article of the faith that evil spirits possess and exercise the power of communicating with man. They can appear to converse and enter into compacts with and even take possession of the bodies of those who are in affinity with themselves, mm. which is true. Which is all true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But holy men and women who have passed from the earth have no such powers or privileges afforded to them. Yes. The permission for intercourse in their case having been withdrawn long ago because the mission of such had been fulfilled. Mm. Uh, and he, he goes on to say that... So he's pointing out the, the lack of logic in such reasoning. On one hand, we're basically saying that evil spirits can still communicate, 
But we're also saying on the other hand that the spirits who have progressed beyond being evil and are now good spirits, they can't communicate. Yeah. Um, God's limited their communication. Yeah. Now that makes no sense whatsoever, no logical sense whatsoever. If a person who's evil can do it, then surely a person who's good can also do it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and and he, he goes on to say that it makes an inference about the nature of God exactly. himself, saying that he would be granting his enemies, God this is, yeah. advantages, which he withholds from his friends. Yes, yeah, yeah. the logic of it is, is, is so unsustainable. When you read quotes like this, it's so, I think, I think the Through the Moose is just full of these kind of quotations where you, you could just say, yeah, that's an awesome statement, you know, just how, you know, this whole concept of how God is making it harder for the people who are good and makes it easier for the people who are bad. Yeah. Like, that is a ludicrous and unrealistic and also untrue viewpoint of God. But, but it's something that most people who are Christian believe. It is something that most people are Christians who are Christian believe. But I feel it's something that most people on earth believe right now. Of course. Because they mm. do see that evil seems to win to out. Win. The angry person wins, the aggressor wins, the person with the most arms, the yeah. whatever. And so I can sort of understand why people get disillusioned. But can you see though? It's, it's really though their emotional predisposition to Absolutely. such a belief, isn't it? It's like a person who has this emotional predisposition to believing that that God is withholding from them yeah. is naturally going to begin, come to believe in a God that's withholding from them. That's right. And uh, and that's a sad thing, I feel. It's, and it's like we had a t discussion the other day where I said, whatever people believe God to be is what they personally finish up becoming. So, so if they God, believe God to be an angry God, then they finish up coming to be an angry person. Yeah. If they believe God to be a punishing God, they personally come to be a punishing person. Yeah, because they justify those kinds of behaviours inside of themselves. Yeah. 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 yeah, sorry, I think I cut you off then. But, no. Um, uh, I was going to say one other thing about that is that, that's right, um, that many Christians, I read something recently that was talking about how many Christians feel they need you to save them from God. Because Basically, God, yeah. if you do use the logic, God does seem like a pretty nasty dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and even the idea that you died as a sacrifice in place of them infers that God is going to be pretty nasty if you didn't do that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's sort of, I feel kind of sad about that because God, the God that I'm developing a relationship with is not like that. Not at all. Well, and the, the, un the unfortunate fact about that is that many believe in a God that's worse than the average person on earth. Yeah. And that is a very sad thing to do. Like, it, it would make logical sense that God is better than any person on earth, and yet we believe in God, a God that is worse than the average person on earth. You know, we believe in a God that murders millions of people. Many Christians believe in a God that murders millions of people. Now, but, uh, if a person on earth murders millions of people, what do we call him? A Hitler type, you know, who's gone along and... Well, it depends. If if you're the leader of the USA, do you call it business as you... Like, as usual. You know, well, not business as usual, but justified means yeah. use of arms or whatever. Exactly. If, um, if you, and... George Bush did say that God talked to him about these things and really it, he obviously believes in a God who does feel it's okay to murder people because yeah. he went on and... And did that. And did that. And made that choice to, of <laughs> preemptive violence even. The book group just suddenly got very political, but anyway. <laughs> but, but it's true, you know, if we look at every aspect of what's really going on with this question, is that here, God, here, here what Kushner is saying is, look, God's given the ability to communicate to every single person. You know, this is why we all have a voice box on earth. We've got the ability to communicate. We all have ears. We've got the same ability to communicate after we've passed. We can talk. We can hear. We've got the same abilities to communicate. And in fact, our abilities to communicate grow. They don't diminish over, over time. So after we've passed, our ability to communicate will improve rather than be diminished. Now, what he's saying, though, is that who we communicate with is going to be very much determined about what our condition is. Yes. The people that you find it easier to communicate with are people who are 
in your current condition. So if we take that analogy, the average person who's so-called schizophrenic, who's finished up speaking with spirits, speaking with people who tell them to kill himself all the time, mm. this is an indication that there is something going on inside of himself, the person, mm. as that causes this attraction and makes the person open to only hearing those particular voices. But just speaking about that, when you have someone who has... Um who has the ability to speak with spirits and perhaps has some fear in their life and they start to hear spirits. And then I know I was trained to tell people, like to basically ignore what people told me about what they could hear, basically undermine their trust in themselves of their own experience. Exactly. Um, it's no little wonder that someone like that ends up in a condition where they feel terrible about themselves and would attract spirits. And, I, and also would... has you know, a long history of medication and then substance abuse and other issues that come along with that. That mess with that your That mess with the way in which you think yep. and, and the way in which you feel. Um, and these things are the subsequent results of the denial of this ability that God's given to all people. Hmm. Um, and I also feel too that we need to understand that we could all be communicating with fantastic people. Mm -hmm. We could all be communicating with fantastic people in the spirit world who are in really good condition, but only if we ourselves are in really good condition. Yeah. It, what, it, the, the whole concept that whatever we are, we will attract, you know, determines what, what happens. Now, I'm not saying though that a person who's communicating with dark spirit is always dark because sometimes they're only dark in a certain area. In other words, they might not have a good love of themselves mm -hmm. and that's what causes the, them to attract such spirits and bad behaviour. There's a willingness in them to hurt themselves, for example, uh, and that causes them to at attract spirits telling them to hurt themselves and mm -hmm. so forth. And then there's a lot of people who communicate all sorts of things from spirits uh, and a lot of spirits who are communicating through lots of people on earth at the moment. Um, and a lot of it's misinformation, a lot of it's just what the spirit has learned and he hasn't learnt very much since his passing. And people take it as gospel. People take it as, oh, this is definitely the truth, without having any idea of what's going on. And this is what this chapter is all about, trying to help people see what is actually going on. Mm. Yeah. And, and I, f I feel that sometimes the... I understand there's a fascination with mediumship because for many people, um, because it's it it has become something that's not very commonplace on the earth, and and people are sort of do have this sort of there's mystery and fascination, and what are they going to say? But I reckon but there's another reason for the fascination too. Yeah, go ahead. And that is the, the that every one of them knows in their sleep state that it can happen. Yeah. <laughs> so of yeah. course they're going yeah. to be fascinated yeah. in their awake state, trying yeah. to learn something that they can. They yeah. do know in their sleep state actually happens. Yeah, yeah. But go on with what you. Ah, uh, well, I, I was just because here um, a little bit earlier in the chapter, Krishna talks about how um, mediumship is viewed in the Lee's family because he actually goes on to say that it's not just Robert who can talk to them, but all the kids and they have friends. And someone came and healed one of the sons and yeah. all these things. And yeah. it's it's a um, it's a really well accepted thing in their family. But yeah. he says. Um, there was nothing to distinguish them from the... Sorry, 156. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, distinguish them from the ordinary run of mankind. Yeah. The privilege was a sacred one, which entailed a great responsibility. So it was never paraded before the vulgar crowd to gratify morbid curiosity. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I personally have feelings about this where I feel like... You know, I've had film crews ask me to channel on camera, and mm. and to me that just feels like Pretty satisfying off. some morbid curiosity for the sake of, and also some desire to attack and discredit anyway. Yeah. yeah, and even at times I feel in the public lectures we we give, I feel some resistance because I feel some of that feeling there of this. Um, there's. For me, it's a it's a big responsibility and a sacred sort of a mm. opportunity I'm being given every mm. time, mm -hmm. um, and I do have a lot of fear about how other people view me, which um, probably lessens my clarity. But I, if I have a sense that where I feel that people are not viewing it as pretty, um, not special, but if they they're not viewing it um, with respect, with honour or respect, yeah. yeah. 
then I then I have that same feeling of resistance. Yeah, yeah of course. And why, you know, why would you want to do something for other people who are just going to use it as a means to attack you later on? Like, mm. you would never choose to do anything. It's like, it's like, would you ever give a person a knife only for them to cut their cut, cut your throat with yeah. it? You know, yeah. no, of course you wouldn't. Yeah. And uh, you know, you would withhold the knife in the first place. So um, this is where I feel a lot of people who don't have a sincere way of investigating truth. Um, they just want to cut people's throats, basically, yeah. with whatever they receive. Why would you want to give them those those gifts? Um, there's got to be some kind of other thing going on if you wanted to give them those gifts. Yeah. You, you give people gifts who appreciate the gifts and who, who want to develop the, the gift themselves. And on the flip side of that, I do see where mediums fall down because they feel this sense of, like, fascination amongst people it begins to feed a different addiction inside of the medium themselves mm -hmm. of oh I get a bit of uh, glory, glory out of this attention. I feel pretty powerful yeah. and and I suppose the point I was wanting to make is that that in itself is degrading the medium's condition and as you said that affects who they can actually talk to and of course what they say then makes less sense what, and the spirits that they attract under those conditions are in a, in, a, in a worse condition and who are just having fun with people or misleading people. Yeah. And the more that it occurs, the worse it gets. And in a way, that's just God's laws in operation. The law of compensation, the law of attraction is all working to help bring the medium to face, oh, something's, something's off, off here and mm. I need to look at myself. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And then I find it interesting that many of the people who criticise mediumship then go, see, see, yeah. see, he wasn't accurate there and see, he wasn't accurate here without understanding, well, accuracy is completely dependent upon condition and as your condition grows and, and your willingness to confront different belief systems change, then the accuracy greatly increases. If you look at the accuracy of Robert James Lees' mediumship, where he could, he could go... He could, he, could, he could listen to a person, Fred, who he's never met, and we see this example in the next book. Uh, he can listen to a person he's never met. He, can, he knows his name, his address, his father's address. He goes and visits his father to work out about a book that happened two days before his death. And, you know, there's all this detail that is, yes. is potentially able to be channeled because the person's in a good yeah. condition. Yeah. yeah. And, and, well, and something that I notice happens a lot is that Sometimes people have those experiences where they suddenly um, know something or know a detail or they're at a funeral and they tell someone something that's really straight from the person who's passed and they do it in the moments where they're not trying, if you like, mm -hmm. or they don't even realise they have the gift. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because they haven't got all the fear of what does it mean, am I crazy, what sort of... It, it, there's no barriers up, so it just comes, comes through. Out, yeah. And I often feel like people who have make amazing scientific discoveries and all... Mm, they, all, all driven by people in the spirit world who are gifts feeding them information. And their desire is, I just really want to, to make this thing happen, I'm fascinated by it, I've got no thought at all of spirits, but... Just that desire opens the opens, communication channel. Yeah, mm. and if you told them that they were channeling, they'd like they'd laugh at you, laugh, freak out, just shut and down. And then when whatever. they pass over in the spirit world, they meet the person who actually gave <laughs> them the information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and okay, so if we go further down that page, yeah. Yeah. Krishna talks. Um, yeah, and Fred is. I love how expressive he is, you know. Yeah. He's just so, what is going on? You're telling me, like, this is just, just a normal, normal thing. <laughs> um, and then Kushner um, has a bit of a discourse there, which I thought is quite beautiful. He says, even, it is even more so when we have the necessary basis of love to work upon and a waiting mind to answer when we speak, the man who hears us will be heard by us and be responded to when he calls. This is the secret of the old time prophet's inspiration. In this incident, you have witnessed nothing new, but have simply been aware, made aware that the old methods and advantages have not been changed or ended. Hmm. Uh, I know it is strange and surprising, but this is because mankind has erred and strayed from the truth, having sold their birthright of open communication for a mess of ecclesiastical, is it? Mm -hmm. Pottage. Mm. 
not because God has changed or his system of government in any way altered. Here he's referring to, again, something from the Bible. Uh, there was uh, this example where I, I, um, sorry, Isaac had two sons. So, mm -hmm. so he, had, he had Jacob and Esau. And, uh, and the, the story in the Bible goes that, that Esau sold his birthright for a pot of stew. And this is what he's referring to here, oh, the fact that what, what we have done is sold these beautiful things, you know, and particularly we've done it ecclesiastically, in other words, with religion. Mm -hmm. We've sold a whole heap of beautiful truths for the sake of a whole heap of false concepts mm -hmm. that are just like pottage, that just satisfy us in the moment but have no eternal benefit whatsoever. Mm. Mm. It's a lot about um, self-reliance, isn't it? Mm. Uh, forget about those gifts and become a good scientific mind, which is really just... I think it's even more about addiction, to yeah. be honest. Like, uh, uh, the main reason why religion has created this pottage of stew yeah. in substitute for the truth is because of other issues with regard to addiction to power, addiction to control, addiction to manipulation, addiction to feed a person's um, underlying demands without confronting their demands and asking them whether their demands are loving. So a lot of the belief systems that have been created in religions of all sorts have been the direct result of people on earth not wanting to face the truth and then wanting to hear a whole heap of rubbish. Mm. And they'd prefer to hear the rubbish than hear the truth. Yeah. And, uh, and in, but in the end, the truth is what gives us all these gifts. And you think of the average person who comes along to our seminars sometimes, they're so afraid of truth. They're so afraid of personal truth. They, you know, they often come up to us asking us something personally with a lot, you know, they're shaking even, like they're so afraid to hear some personal truth. Yeah. And this is, a, this is an indication of how far we've gotten away from wanting to even know the truth. Mm. So many people don't want to even know the truth anymore. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit fascinated by Christianity, obvious, for probably obvious reasons. Yeah. And because I, I haven't been raised in a church in this last 34 years, yeah. um, so I, I read a bit of Christian literature and see what's happening uh, on the internet and different things. And it seems like uh, I've had a bit of exposure to American church um, culture. And while I, there seems to be a, kind of a movement towards, hey, something's up here, the vast majority is all about making ourselves feel good mm -hmm. in a big church with a lot of music and mm -hmm. like singing hallelujahs but there doesn't seem to be a lot of people just challenging people with the truth and mm -hmm. and and then I observe some people who do and they cop a lot while there's some response they seem to cop a lot of um like that man who doesn't believe there is a eternal torment yes um, I, forget. I mentioned Christian him in the last minister. group actually yeah, yeah. and and yeah, amount of flack he gets from all sorts of people, doesn't he? From mainstream Orthodox religious yes. re Christian religion, is a, is amazing. But he has the most logical stance about yeah. the truth about God. Yeah, and and I suppose you know, not even to just speak about Christianity. I feel in most groups on the planet at the moment, there's a severe resistance to people just talking straight to each other. Yeah, we see it a lot in even new age circles. Sometimes we're invited to go along and give a talk to somewhere and you, you just have to start speaking about the truth about reincarnation, for example, and man, you get, you get rage from yes. most people and the spirits with them because they like the connection. They like to believe that's actually the truth and they don't want to face any, any of the facts surrounding it. They just want to be, they want to feel good. They want to make themselves feel like they're special and make themselves feel like that it's the right thing and make themselves feel like all sorts of feelings that they're actually avoiding through this yeah. process. And that's why I'm saying that I feel that a lot of it's just about addiction. Like what mankind has come to do is they've, they've come to focus more on feeding the addictions of the masses, right? the opium for the people, if you mm -hmm. like, which is, you know, was it Lenin or, or Marx said that uh, religion is the opium of the people? Yeah. And, and it is the opium of the people for most people because it is, the, the reality is 
that most religious thought has not been created on any basis of truth, but rather has been created to feed an addiction inside of the person to feel good. Yeah. And once they have that addiction met, then they are a member of that religion often for the rest of their lives. Yeah, and but most people like feel that that's okay. Mm. You know, there mm. is a feeling I feel on the planet that, yes, you should do what makes you feel good. Mm. It's sort of like... Um, a rebellion against some of this really, you know, around the turn of the last century, which was a lot about deny yourself for God and deny. And now people are like, no, no, <laughs> that's all wrong. And it is. Mm. <laughs> but it's like this movement in the other direction. And a lot of people have left religion, especially in this country, because they feel like, no, we should just have this hedonistic kind of a lifestyle and yeah and i'm not saying in fact that uh a, I don't agree with a hedonistic lifestyle but there's a lot of joy and happiness that comes from knowing the truth yes um and in fact far more joy and happiness comes from knowing the truth than from not knowing it or believing a lie and i feel a lot of people have sort of developed a lot of mistrust of of religion in particular we we get this a lot, you know. You, um, mm -hmm. We're often accused of starting a new religion when we, you know, all we do is give seminars, for example, you know, because people have so much mistrust about any time you mention about God, Jesus, Bible, or any of those other things. There's all of a sudden there's automatic assumption that goes on in, inside of most people, and these automatic assumptions are driven by a lot of their fears mm -hmm. and a lot of their. And you can understand why there's a lot of fear because the reality is religion historically has had a huge amount of control of great masses of people. It's caused huge amounts of damage on the planet. A lot of murders, rapes and other things that have occurred on the planet historically have been occurred due to the justification of religious, of different religious denominations. And there is still a lot of problems going on because of religious, these religious issues. And you can understand why people eventually say religion is wrong. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, most religion is wrong. Um, if because while it practices concepts that are out of harmony with love, it's wrong. wrong. <laughs> and and the problem is that most religion doesn't even answer these basic questions. Yeah. Like even this basic question of spirit communication. How many religions on the earth actually agree with spirit communication? Mm -hmm. There's only there's only one format I would say who does at this point in time. Uh, two potentially, but one all the time. And one is the New Age movement. They believe in spirit communication. Of course, they also believe in reincarnation and other things that are false, which complicate the entire mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the Christian faith that believe in inspiration, yeah. but they believe it's from God. Yeah. So they close down all form, other forms of inspiration, really. And, and, so, and then what have you got after that? Everyone believes it from the devil yeah. <laughs> uh, and are totally petrified of it. These are the... And yet, there's this one, knowing this one truth can free so many people, not only free them from religious bondage, but also free them from so-called health problems as well. Yeah. That's yeah. the irony. All like, I find it so ironic that just this one issue, and there's so many issues like that. Just a person's belief in God creates all these problems, and a person's belief about death creates all these mm. problems, and a person's belief about what the soul is creates all these problems. Mm. And, and all of them indicate when we're out of harmony with truth. Yeah. Yeah, well, and Fred says here quite aptly, no one needs to be told that creed and reason are at variance. That is what kept me outside of the church all my life. So mm. that logic and your faith should be at variance. It's, yeah. Is, is something that repels a great many people as well. Of course. It? And, and it, faith and logic should be totally in harmony yeah. it, it would make complete sense actually if god is the if god exists yeah. then god would be the creator of the, the entire universe if god's the creator of the entire universe then god is the knower of all truth the more faith and the more knowledge we have of god it would make sense that the more logic we have and the more we understand about the universe science sci a true scientists are actually people who understand this under, underlying fact. This is mm -hmm. why someone like Einstein is so, so uh, well known because yeah. he understood that the God of religion was not the God that he understood, the God of the universe he was studying. Yeah. And, uh, and so he applied his logic to the God of the universe and as a result of that, found out many truths about the universe, mm -hmm. scientific truths that he would not have otherwise discovered. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 
somewhere earlier in the book it um, talks about the gift of reason that God has given us, mm. that it is a gift from God. Yeah, that, um, yeah. We can very powerful yeah. gift. Yeah. And, and it's interesting how oftentimes people say you've got to throw away reason for the sake of faith, whereas I feel reason creates faith. Yeah. It's the opposite. You know, yeah. you can't throw away reason for the sake of faith. The two are not opposites in some way, you know, or can't coexist. Reason creates mm -hmm. faith. It's only the things that we can reasonably see as true that will create any faith. So when I go to switch on a light, I now know through my reason of how it all works that there's a high likelihood the light above my head is going to go on, yeah. right, because I understand how it works. Yeah. And, uh, and then I go and switch it off and I know why it's gone off, you yeah. know. And I know, you know, it's, it's not like the average person who, who is in the Western world goes, oh, the lights have gone out. Oh, that's interesting. Somebody, some, something mysterious must have happened. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. go straight to the power board and see whether the power has <laughs> gone down, right? Yeah. And, and, and this is what we need to apply to the entire of our life. There yeah. is a logical reason why everything is happening. Yeah. And we need to understand the logical reason. And faith and this logical reason are not at variance with each other. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very true. Mm. Okay, um, so probably the last bit in the chapter that I thought was worth discussing, uh, there's probably a couple more bits, but at the bottom of page 157, Krishna talks about what you um, talked about earlier, and that is the role of sympathy in spirit communication. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and choice, which is... Mm -hmm. I relate very much to desire and pure desire. Like mm. he's saying, because Fred says, but the evil and the good spirits have equal facility for communication, don't they? And Krishna says, well, yes, but here's a couple of things you should note about that. Mm -hmm. uh, first, there is no bondage of force or in any condition of your, our life, which that in itself is just an amazing truth, isn't it? Mm. There is no bondage of force in any condition in our life, like right now. Mm -hmm. There's no bondage, like I can make any choice I want mm -hmm. right at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no one forcing you to make a choice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so every soul is free to make its own choice, but they naturally choose that which is most congenial. And, and this is where, yep. um, the, you know, he talks about sympathy. Mm. That the meadows are natural to the sheep and the water to the fish and the air to the birds. Mm. Um, so you don't actually have to control what they do because they'll go to where they feel most naturally at home. Exactly. Um, and so that's the analogy of how um, a sinner can no more dwell in the region of a saint than a, than a sheep can soar up within the company of an eagle. Yeah, I thought that was an excellent quote, that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very true. Very true. Mm. Um, so this is this is the power of sympathy that that he is really the illustration, the the, the overreaching illustration of both mm. examples that were shown in the chapter, isn't it? Yeah. So if we expect to get enlightening information, new information from the spirit world, we can't stay in the condition we're currently in. We've got to change our condition. Mm. And as you can see through this chapter you know, the brightness of your condition is going to determine who actually comes to you mm -hmm. um, and also whether you're going to receive the information that's given when they come. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, when this attraction of sympathy has been established, whether it be of a holy or unholy nature, the souls naturally gravitate towards each other. But no soul from our side is ignorant of the fact that it is individually responsible for whatever results therefrom. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so here what he's really saying is that uh, the people who communicate with people on earth do understand the results they are actually having. So the spirits who are communicating negative things, they do see the negative effects of their negative mm -hmm. communications on earth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they enjoy them. They yeah. enjoy the negative effects. Um, the spirits who are of a higher condition, who have more love in them, they are very concerned about making sure that they transmit information that's accurate, truthful, honest, open, and also doesn't mislead people on earth. And they are also very aware when a medium has their own belief systems interfering with what's being transmitted. They're very aware of that. Sometimes they like that even. Yeah. 
Sometimes they like the medium having misinformation and that way they can feed the medium more in misinformation. So very important, and I think Hugh too, and he refers to this in other places, is very important for both the spirit and the person who's channeling information or the medium of the information is really honest and truthful about their own condition and the information they're receiving mm. and transmitting. Because mm. it can have a very negative effect on earth or a very positive one depending on... Mm. On, on on the underlying source. Yeah, and, and as always in this book, there's a lot of discussion about the spirit world and earth and the, the relationship between the two. But I also see the truth, the, like the truth that exists in those relationships also exists in all our earthly mm. uh, relationships. Mm. And uh, something that struck me reading that last passage about, the, you know, the air in the bird in the air and the fish in the water is that, you know, I know when we're in this negative condition with ourselves or in error-based belief systems, we gravitate towards um, people in in sympathy with that. In, of course. In either, like with, as I explained to the group, in the same set of belief systems. Mm. So it could be that I believe it's okay to be violent, men, for, men to be violent with me, so I'll attract men who believe it's okay to be violent with me. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably hang out with a bunch of women who have the same belief system. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it often feels to me, as I grow and as I want to challenge my error, I often feel like a fish out of water. That's a part of sometimes me recognising, oh, this is so uncomfortable. I think this is, I'm challenging something here. Like a, a, mm. I'm trying to grow towards being an eagle rather than a fish or, or uh, whatever. Uh. So, And in that, a way, being a fish out of water is a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's, pre it's showing you that there must be something inside of you that draws you away from the status quo and into a new condition. Well, and that's from that passage, that's this idea that he says there's two things. There's your choice and there's sympathy. Yeah. And I suppose I understand well how sympathy works, but it's always good to remember I have choice. Yeah. I was just thinking, uh, if you're saying that, that one, uh, one good thing for the majority of the people who are listening to this discussion to think about would be this what is the average conversation they attract during the course of their day? Mm. If the average conversation they attract during the course of their day is about the weather or about, you know, some physical thing or family or what, just mundane issues of life, then that's an indication of what they're sympathetic towards. Yeah. If the average conversation they attract is a lot more deeper, soul enriching and uh, causes them to grow and think and, and be challenged, then that's an indication of their true soul desire as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that a lot of people attract the first hmm. and, uh, and, and that's an indication that there is a huge need for them to be honest about their true condition. Yeah, and I feel that that's the point because I, I notice this all the time with myself uh, now and not just in the conversations I attract, what am I spending most of my day doing? What am I looking at on the internet? If I spend an hour on the internet, what's the percentage of time I spend looking at, uh, you know, I don't know recipes as opposed to other people's ideas as mm. opposed to things that I'm actually like That'll spiritual grow matters as a person, that yeah. are challenging me to grow mm. and the thing that I've learned is like in the situation of looking at what you spend your time at on on the internet or the conversations you have is not to then try to manufacture something different but like you said be honest what is happening here mm -hmm. and only from there can I develop a desire. And I tell you, by doing it that way, not trying to deal with the effects, if you will, like when I run into you, instead of talking about your sore knee, talk about God. Like, when which is just all you're doing is trying to talk about God and you don't really feel like doing it. Exactly. And you've attracted someone who wants to talk about this. Sore knee. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I just notice how it shifts just just yeah. without me trying, yeah. without me trying to think about what I spend my time on the internet. In the last month, that whole equation has changed completely for me yeah. just by developing more humility and honesty with myself. Yeah. So, well, it's yeah. a bit like what I mentioned in the recent talk about what is your treasure. Um, yeah, very similar. Like, obviously, the things we treasure, we spend the most time doing and, and we spend the most of our time thinking about and we spend the most of our time feeling about and do, and actually taking actions on. And so if you look at the course of the day and what you spend the most time doing, for the majority of people, they'd find that, that they spend the most time doing things that they'd be quite shocked about. Yeah. 
Now, whatever we spend the most time doing is also an indication of, of who we're going to attract because we're going to attract groups of people who also want to spend the most of their time doing the same thing. Yeah. And, uh, and also we're going to attract the same kind of spirits as that yeah. who are going to attract. We're going to attract the same kind of spirits who want to do exactly the same kind of thing and spend most of their time doing that. So um, this is something that I feel a lot of people don't understand about their spirit attra attractions. Mm. They, they believe somehow they can modify or manipulate them, but without changing their own character. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I suppose this is another chapter in a way that looks at beliefs and character again. Mm -hmm. It's another chapter that's say, saying, look at your belief systems. In this case, your belief about death. Look at your character. What kind of nature do you have? What kind of things are you attracted to? Because because your belief systems and your character are going to greatly determine who influences you in your life and which spirits are going to be communicating with you during your life. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, very true, very powerful. Mm. Um, okay, if we go just to the last section in this chapter, um, <laughs> because Fred says, um, I, I feel him here, he says, that, like he's saying, don't you find it deplorable the state of this communication that happens with the earth? Because everyone's in their sympathy, all the fish are in the water and all All the addictions and, are in play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and Krishna says quite a few stirring things here. Yeah. Um, and I would love to hear what you feel about them. Uh, he says, the present time on earth is characterized by a great thirst for knowledge. There is an earnest spirit of inquiry after truth. Mm. Um, and do you feel that that is true? Yes, I do. Like, um, I do feel that there are more and more people being more and more honest about the fact that uh, most, most religious thought hasn't given them the answers they want. Science hasn't been the, the answer that they thought that they, they would receive. And one reason why is because it, it, it's quite limited emotionally in terms of what it will investigate. Mm -hmm. and, and so they're still looking for answers, many people, and the desire to look for answers is growing. And then, of course, um, there's also this um, feeling, I feel, in most people that when something makes sense to them, then they'll have a listen to it. And, and there is a great amount of dismissive uh, attitude towards things that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And you can understand why. Mm -hmm. it, it makes complete sense to do that, to, to get rid of out of your thought process anything that doesn't really make that much sense. But you've got to be careful about that because a lot of times you need more knowledge to determine what makes sense. Mm -hmm. And people, I feel one thing that the trap that people are falling into with it is that they are often presented with the truth and because it doesn't make sense to their current conception they're willing to dismiss it without actually investigating it further. There is a deep fear in changing a belief system only to find out that that belief system they've changed to is also false. And so, and so there is a deep reticence also amongst people with their search for truth to, to experiment. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that is one of the things that needs to change. But I do feel people have a strong desire for knowledge and truth and that is, still, that is driving many people. Yeah, because um, if we think about this was channeled maybe a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. thereabouts. Yeah, and that's about when the deep knowledge, desire for knowledge really began in a lot of ways. A lot of questioning. Yeah. Um, but if we look at that time period, say from then till now, I do agree, I feel a lot of people have looked at belief systems in error on the earth and gone, no, nah, it doesn't make sense, we're throwing it out. Mm. But I'm not sure that I feel that it's been replaced with a lot of truth. No, like and that's I because feel... of the disillusionment feeling that I mentioned. Yeah. I feel a lot of people are disillusioned with the discovery of truth. So now there's a growing movement that, oh, there's no such thing as truth. This postmodernist you know, like... kind of idea that yeah. there is no one truth and, yeah. you know, we just all have to find our own truth. And I feel there's a lot of sadness in that, I've had that belief system yeah, and there's a sadness. lot of sadness in me yeah. that drove that and, yeah. and a feeling that you can never really make everyone happy and you can, no one can ever really be happy and so you just sort of... But it's also driven from a false concept of God, like this whole, whole concept that God created us and then tried to hide everything from us. And you know. It's yet another belief system that makes you think God's not such a nice guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 
Krishna goes on to say that in the human soul there has always been a natural craving to rend the veil which hides immortality from view, and I agree with that. Yeah, well, that, you know, quite often by the media we're asked, why do people go to your seminars when you're saying you're Jesus? And I say, it's got nothing to do with me saying I'm Jesus. In fact, for a lot of people, they wouldn't want to come to my seminars yeah. because I'm saying <laughs> yeah. I'm Jesus. But when they come and they hear a lot of reasonable and logical explanations for almost everything they ask, now there's the soul satisfaction of that craving for truth mm -hmm. and that's what drives many people to want to know more. Mm, yeah. Mm. And he says something here, a craving born of the inspiration which forebodes success. What does that mean? <laughs> well, um, I think what he's referring to here is the fact that um, we, we, are often, we often get inspired before success can occur. Mm -hmm. So if you look at most of the people who have ever become successful in the past, they've always had some kind of inspiration that has occurred before success actually yes. happened. And I feel that uh, oftentimes our craving for truth is driven by the fact that we want to mm -hmm. know truth, we want to have success. And so we're, and we're often being inspired, particularly by spirits, that, we, that truth is available. Mm. And because of this inspiration that we receive, that truth is available, we constantly start, we go back to the idea that truth is available. So even though, we're, 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 you, like if you look at your own life, you've been so disillusioned at much, through much of your life, and, then, and disillusioned about truth being available, and, but, but there's still that soul feeling that maybe the truth is available. <laughs> yeah. And that's the inspiration that, that drives... That creates success in the end. Yeah, that yeah. creates the success of finding the yeah. truth in yeah. the end. Yeah, yeah. lovely. Yeah. Thank you. And now I'm just reading on and finding that Krishna actually says something similar to what we were saying before, uh, or what I said earlier. But the inquirers, while breaking free from errors in one direction are generally bound to hold with even greater tenacity to others, which lie in another direction. Yeah. So that the attraction they form is not with spirits whom the truth has made entirely free, but lower minds who stand in close affinity with their own desires. Yeah. And so it's almost like somebody, somebody decides, oh, I can't believe that particular thing anymore. So what they do is they throw away that particular belief system, but then... They, they don't get rid of the emotional desire that drove their desire to believe that thing. Mm -hmm. And so they just go and find another belief system that satisfies that emotion and, and in that process completely disconnect from many spirits that could give them a higher oh, view of truth. truth. So, you know, it's quite sad what happens. In, in, in some ways what they're doing is they're shifting from side to side all the time. Yeah. It's sort of like moving from that, that doesn't work, move to that, that doesn't work, move to that, that doesn't work. And after three or four times, many people become totally disillusioned and don't move anywhere, mm. but they stay in the same condition, still trying to satisfy the emotions and addictions through different means. Yeah. Um, it's a courageous person. It's like he said, I like the quote here where he said, daring souls, yes. regardless of the church and, and anybody yeah. else, are pushed to inquiry. Yeah. Daring souls. Yeah. And it is a daring soul who, who stops this sideways shift constantly and then starts to actually go ahead and progress to a new thing that's not easily found on the planet. Yeah, yeah and the note I've written in my margin was um, that on earth, often when we break, break through free from a doctrine that we decide is in error, we don't actually grieve it. We don't actually grieve how that feels, you know, how that we were really invested in something that turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And I see this in people who've been really religious and then they just go, that's it. It's all crap. It's all control. It's all this. And there's so much anger and unfelt grief. Yeah. And that actually, um, this sort of rebellion against the pain of having believed in a doctrine that's false yeah. actually leaves people in that state where they just go in the other direction or bounce around, but they never mm. actually open themselves to truth. And, and this is where humility is so essential, isn't it? Yeah. Unless we grieve. And we've seen that happen a lot in the spirit world, haven't we? Definitely. Like where, where Christians or people with other firm beliefs have passed into the spirit world They've realised that their belief systems haven't saved them, that their belief systems weren't correct. And then instead of just going, well, maybe I just need to change a few of them, <laughs> they get into this huge rage uh, about the fact that all of the beliefs must be wrong and they throw them all away in rage. 
and they become so enraged and embroiled in their rage that quite often their condition even degrades further after they've passed. And it's such a sad thing. And this is one of the, um, I feel one of the dangers of teaching untruth is that if you teach people untruth, you've got not only the danger that, that they've been taught an untruth, but now you've got the danger of their lack of trust in anything being truthful. Yeah. And, and that is a very, very sad thing that happens to the majority of people who finish up passing over into the spirit world. If they at least even understood intellectually the truth, they'd be in a far better condition and pass in a far better condition because they wouldn't have to throw away a whole heap of things and also experience the disappointment and frustration and anger and resentment that comes from being taught things all of your life that have turned out to be false. Yeah, and it, you make that analogy with truth, but I also see it with love. Mm -hmm. When we've been in a relationship with someone, our parents or a partner or someone who says continually that they love us and then we come to feel that when this is not love that I'm receiving, there's a feeling inside that love doesn't exist because mm. what I was given wasn't the real wasn't thing. The thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I and I and that's why I feel Kushna finishes off with these cautions. Yes, because because every single time untruth is taught, there's not only the effect of the untruth itself. So there's there's all these tentacles of the effect of untruth. But in terms of correcting it, it makes it so much harder to correct. Yeah. You, you've got this additional problem of overcoming the untruth and then trying as well to, to then put the truth out into a group of people who are now resistive to hearing anything yeah. that, that, you know, as a result of their previous experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's a sad, sad thing, I feel. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and also that he... he he cautions, but he also says, uh, you know, we're not in two classes, good and evil. Yeah. So there's great... There's millions of different grades of development. <laughs> and, and I feel that also for people who are listening and people who are wanting to develop their mediumship is that I see very often people say, oh, there's dark spirits with that person. Oh, they, you know, and it's, it's a judgment. It's a lot of judgment, yeah. And it's, it's a, it cuts, cuts things off. It means that they are actually repel like they're they're actually attracting more of those spirits through their anger at them mm. um but they're also repelling any possibility of growing themselves and for the spirit to grow as well yeah and also you can learn a lot of truth from a sincere dark spirit it's totally, just a matter of whether they're so sincere much. or not you know if, yeah. if a person is sincere and they're coming to you but they're in a dark condition you can learn a lot of things from them, particularly if they're in the spirit world and you've never been there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that can be learnt through this communication. It's just a matter of being open to the different laws mm -hmm. that govern rapport yeah. in, with the spirit world, that govern communication with the spirit world. Yeah, and I often see people who judge, oh, that person's got that injury or that, per that spirit's got this. And, and yet in other areas, that person or that spirit might have actually a lot more knowledge. Mm. But second point is that often people who are in who've been treated really badly and they are in a sad, dark condition, we've seen it happen time and again in the spirit world. They progress the most rapidly because they've learnt humility. Yes. And this judgment that people put out, and yeah. I've done it too, is not is the opposite of humility. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. It's, it's a condemnation of a person without understanding their life. Yeah. 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 So that brings us to the end of the chapter, does it? Yeah, that's mm. the end. Thank you very much yep. for having that discussion with me. So that's um, the end of our chapter 13. Yes. Uh, next time we get together, yep. we'll discuss chapter 14, yep. which is called The Relationship of Sleep to Death. And if people are following along, next time um, I'll try to develop some homework that you might want to do as you read chapter 15 that will be and then as we talk through the chapter hopefully that will address some of your some of the homework questions as well yeah so, that'd yeah. be good yeah. thank you okay thanks darling thanks darling <laughs>